Chapter 3. What's to be done with the Iron Man? So the spring came round the following year, leaves unfurled from the buds, daffodils spread up from the soil, and everywhere the grass shook new green points. The round hill over the Iron Man was covered with new grass. Before the end of the summer, sheep were grazing on the fine grass on the lovely hillock. People who had never heard of the Iron Man saw the green hill as they drove past on their way to the sea, and they said, What a lovely hill! What a perfect place for a picnic! So people began to picnic on top of the hill. Soon, quite a path was worn up there by people climbing to eat their sandwiches and take snaps of each other. One day, a father, a mother, a little boy, and a little girl stopped their car and climbed the hill for a picnic. They had never heard of the Iron Man, and they thought the hill had been there forever. They spread a tablecloth on the grass. They set down the plate of sandwiches, a big pie, a roasted chicken, a bottle of milk, a bowl of tomatoes, a bag full of boiled eggs, a dish of butter, and a loaf of bread, with cheese and salt and cups. The father got his stove going to boil some water for tea, and they all lay back on rugs munching food and waiting for the kettle to boil until the blue sky. Suddenly, the father said, That's funny. What is it? asked mother. I felt the ground shake, the father said. Here, right beneath us. Probably an earthquake in Japan, said the mother. An earthquake in Japan? cried the little boy. How could that be? So the father began to explain how an earthquake in a far distant country that shakes down buildings and empties lakes sends a jolt right around the earth. People far away in other countries feel it as nothing more than a slight trembling of the ground. An earthquake that knocks a city flat in South America might do no more than shake a picture off a wall in Poland. But as the father was talking, the mother gave a little gasp, then a yelp. The chicken, she said, the cheese, the tomatoes. Everybody sat up. The tablecloth was sagging in the middle. As they watched, the sag got deeper, and all the food fell into it, dragging the tablecloth right down into the ground. The ground underneath was splitting, and the tablecloth, as they watched, slowly folded and disappeared into the crack, and they were felt staring at a jagged black crack in the ground. The crack grew. It widened. It lengthened. It ran between them. The mother and the girl were on one side, and the father and the boy were on the other side. The little stove toppled into the growing crack with a clatter, and the kettle disappeared. They could not believe their eyes. They stared at the widening crack. Then, as they watched, an enormous iron hand came up through the crack, groping around in the air, feeling over the grass and on either side of the crack. It nearly touched the little boy, and he rolled over backwards. The mother screamed. Run to the car, shouted the father. They all ran. They jumped into the car. They drove. They did not look back. So they did not see the great iron head, square like a bedroom, with red glaring headlamp eyes, and with the tablecloth, still with the chicken and the cheese, draping across the top of it, rising out of the top of the hillock, as the iron man freed himself from the pit. When the farmers realised that the iron man had freed himself, they groaned. What could they do now? They decided to call the army, who could pound him to bits with anti-tank guns. But Hogarth had another idea. At first, the farmers would not hear of it, least of all his own father. But at last they agreed. Yes, they would give Hogarth's idea a trial. And if it failed, they will call in the army. After spending a night and a day eating all the barbed wire for miles around, as well as hinges he tore off gates and the tin cans he found in ditches, the three new tractors and two cars and a lorry, the Iron Man was resting in a clump of elm trees. There he stood, leaning among the huge branches, almost hidden by the dense leaves, his eyes glowing a soft blue. The farmers came near, along a lane, in cars so they could make a quick getaway if things went wrong. They stopped fifty yards from the clump of elm trees. He really was a monster. This was the first time most of them had had a good look at him. His chest was big as a cattle truck. His arms were like cranes, and he was getting rusty, probably from eating all the old barbed wire. Now Hogarth walked up towards the Iron Man. Hello, he shouted and stopped. Hello, Mr. Iron Man. The Iron Man made no move. His eyes did not change. Then Hogarth picked up a rusty old horseshoe and knocked it against a stone, 
clunk, clunk, clunk. At once the Iron Man's eyes turned darker blue, then purple, then red, and finally white, like a car headlamps. It was the only sign he gave of having heard. Mr. Iron Man, shouted Hogarth. We've got all the iron you want, all the food you want, and you can have it for nothing, if only you'll stop eating up the farms. The Iron Man stood up straight. Slowly he turned, till he was looking directly at Hogarth. We're sorry we trapped you and buried you, shouted the little boy. We promise we'll not deceive you again. Follow us and you can have all the metal you want. Brass too, aluminium too, and lots of old chrome. Follow us. The Iron Man pushed aside the boughs and came into the lane. Hogarth joined the farmers. Slowly they drove back down the lane, and slowly, with all the cogs humming, the Iron Man stepped after them. They led through the villages. Half the people came out to share, half ran to shut themselves inside bedrooms and kitchens. Nobody could believe their eyes when they saw the Iron Man marching behind the farmers. At last they came to the town, and there was a great scrap metal yard. Everything was there, old cars by the hundred, old trucks, old railway engines, old stoves, old refrigerators, old springs, bedsteads, bicycles, grinders, gates, pans, all the scrap iron of the region was piled up there, rusting away. There, cried Hogarth, eat all you can. The Iron Man gazed and his eyes turned red. He kneeled down in the yard. He stretched out one elbow. He picked up a greasy black stove and chewed it like a toffee. There were delicious crumbs of chrome on it. He followed that with a double deck of bedstead, and the brass knobs made his eyes crackle with joy. Never before had the Iron Man eaten such delicacies. As he lay there, a big truck turned into the yard and unloaded a pile of rusty chain. The Iron Man lifted a handful and let it dangle into his mouth, better than any spaghetti. So there they left him. It was an Iron Man's heaven. The farmers went back to their farms. Hogarth visited the Iron Man every few days. Now the Iron Man's eyes were constantly a happy blue. He was no longer rusty. His body gleamed blue like a new gun barrel, and he ate, ate, ate endlessly. Okay, let's go through chapter three in a bit more detail. What's to be done with the Iron Man? So the spring came round the following year, leaves unfilled from the buds, daffodils spread up from the soil, and everywhere the grass shook new green roots. Nice little uh, prefix and suffix to show students. Daffodils spread up from the soil and everywhere the grass shook new, I love this, shook new green points. This first sort of paragraph really gives a sense that the environment is, is coming to life. Things are starting to blossom. Spring is, spring is coming. The round hill over the Iron Man was covered with new grass. Before the end of the summer, sheep were grazing on the fine grass on the lovely hillock. People who had never heard of the Iron Man saw the green hill as they drove past on their way to the sea, and they said, what a lovely hill, what a perfect place for a picnic. Again, we have that speech, those inverted commas coming in. So people began to picnic on top of the hill. Soon, nice little soon comma, quite a path was worn up there by people climbing to eat their sandwiches and take snaps of each other. One day, a father, a mother, a little boy and a little girl stopped their car and climbed the hill for a picnic. Again, because Ted Hughes uses the commas so much in this, the commas naturally just stand out more, setting that pace, keeping that pace. They had never heard of the Iron Man and they had thought the hill had been there forever. It's interesting because it's always like, before this, it seems like time is just coming and coming and coming. And then we have this moment where this hill, th these people recognize that this hill had never been there before. They, they've never heard of the hill, I should say. And this is the moment where the chapter changes. We know that something is coming. They spread a tablecloth on the grass. They set down a plate of sandwiches, a big pie, a roast chicken, a bottle of milk, a bowl of tomatoes, a bag full of boiled eggs, a dish of butter and a loaf of bread with cheese and salt and chips. Again, Ted Hughes is going to detail that he likes to go into every chapter. He goes, he goes into it a bit more after this, but he focuses on that detail. The father got his stove going to boil some 
got his stove going to boil some water for tea, and they all lay back on rugs, munching food and waiting for the kettle to boil under the blue sky. It's a scene that lots of readers, especially students, if this is towards towards children, they would really recognise, they'd really understand. Oh, yeah, this is a typical scene. And they, they, if we go back a page, they would recognise all these um, these different types of foods. Oh, yeah, my family does this, my family does this, and this is what I bring. It's a nice relating paragraph that we can draw a lot out of. Suddenly, the father said, That's funny. What is it? asked the mother. I thought the ground shake, the father said. Here, right beneath us. Probably an earthquake in Japan, said the mother. An earthquake in Japan, cried the little boy. How could that be? Lovely little piece of text that we have, which we can see quite a lot of dialogue happening. And we have new speaker, new line. Uh, we can also mention, okay, we have a comma here. Um, and we have a... Not, not that part. Let's just go back. We can also mention, why do we have a colon here and not a comma? And bring that into it. So we have these the, this conversation going, which is a nice little excerpt. So the father began to explain how an earthquake in far distant country, in a far distant country, that shakes down buildings and empties lakes, sends a jolt right through the earth. People far away in other countries feel it is nothing more than a slight trembling of the ground. An earthquake that knocks a city flat in South America might do no more than shake a picture off a wall in Poland. But as the father was talking, the mother gave a little gasp, then a yelp. Nice little build-up. Um, in a way, it's a superlative, not really. But a gasp, then a yelp. It's increasing its its volume. It's in um, intensity. The chicken, she cried. The cheese, the tomato. Nice um, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. This is also really good to bring out in children's writing, not just a full stop or a comma. Everybody sat up. Nice short sentence for impact. The tablecloth was sagging in the middle. As they watched, the sag got deeper and all the food fell into it, dragging the tablecloth right down into the ground. The ground beneath them was splitting and the tablecloth, as they watched, slowly folded and disappeared into the crack. And they were left staring at a jagged black crack in the ground. Okay, we have a crack, crack, crack. He's, he uses the nouns a lot in this. It was there before. He keeps using the same snaps, I think it was, taking a snap. No, something else. But he doesn't use a variety of, of, of nouns and um, pronouns and it um, pronouns of nouns and it just can kind of grate to the ear but it's his style and he sticks to it the crack grew it widened it length so we've got crack 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 widened and length it length it ran between them the mother and the girl were on one side and the father and the boy were on the other side the little stove toppled into the grow growing crack with a clater and the kettle disappeared they could not believe their eyes with a clatter, sorry. They could not believe their eyes. They stared at the widening crack. <laughs> crack, crack, crack. Then, as they watched, an enormous iron hand came up through the crack, groping around the in the air, feeling over the grass on either side of the crack. It nearly touched the boy, and he rolled over backwards. The mother screamed, Run to the car, shouted the father. They all ran. Good, short sentences. They jumped into the car. Full stop. They drove. Full stop. They did not look back. Good. Boom. 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 It gives that, again, that sense of pace. It's going, this is what happened. Then this. Then this. There's no time to think. There's only time to act. And that's what Ted Hughes is doing in this paragraph. So they did not see the great iron head, square like a bedroom, with red glaring headlamp eyes, and with the tablecloth, still with the chicken and the cheese, wrapped, draped across the top of it, rising out of the top of the hillock, as the iron man freed himself from the pit. When the farmers realised that the Iron Man had freed himself, they groaned. What could they do now? They decided to call the army, who would pound him to bits with their anti-tank guns. But Hogarth had another idea. At first, the farmers would not hear of it, least of all his own father. But at last they agreed. Yes, they would give Hogarth, Hogarth's idea a trial. This is nice because it... um adds a bit of a tension within the paragraph. At first, the farmers would not hear of it, least of all his own father. Well, also students can add uh, that little tension in their own writing by having just one simple sentence. Uh, you know, my character had an idea to attack. However, he was a little bit scared and thought that this wouldn't work. In any case, he, he charged on. So you can show how that shows a bit of diversity, a bit of depth to their writing. And if all failed, they would call in the army. 
After spending a night and a day eating all the barbed wire for miles around, as well as hinges, he tore off gates and the tin cans he found in ditches. The three new tractors and the two cars in a lorry, the Iron Man was resting in a clump of elm trees. There he stood, leaning among the huge branches, almost hidden by the dense leaves, his eyes glowing a soft blue. His eyes are coming more into the picture. The farmers came near along a lane in cars so that it would make a quick getaway if things went wrong. They stopped 50 yards from the clump of elm trees. He really was a monster. This was the first time most of them had had a good look at him. His chest was as big as a cattle truck. His arms were like cranes, and he was getting rusty, probably from eating all the old barbed wires. Nice new vocabulary coming through here. Cattle truck, cranes, people, I don't know that. Now Hogarth walked up towards the Iron Man. Hello, shouted Hogarth and stopped. Hello, Mr. Iron Man. The Iron Man made no move. His eyes did not change. Then Hogarth picked up a rusty old horseshoe and knocked it against a stone. Clonk, clonk, clonk. Nice little colon here. And then we have clonk, clonk, clonk on the bottom of here. At once the Iron Man's eyes turned darker blue, then purple, then red, his processing, and finally white, clarity, like a car headlamps. It was the only sign he gave of having heard. Mr. Iron Man shouted Hogarth. We've got all the iron you want, all the food you want, and you can have it for nothing if only you'll stop eating up the farms. The Iron Man stood up straight. Slowly he turned, still, until he was looking directly at Hogarth. We're sorry we trapped you and buried you, shouted the little boy. We promise we'll not deceive you again. Follow us and you can have all the metal you want. Brass too, aluminium too, and lots of old chrome. Follow us. Very nice when you're teaching direct speech to have to remind students that you can have full stops in direct speech. Lots of students are afraid of that. The Iron Man pushed aside the bows and came into the lane. Both. Hogarth joined the farmers. Slowly they drove back down the lane, and slowly, with all his cogs humming, the Iron Man stepped after them. They led through the villages. Half the people came out to stare. Half ran to shut themselves inside bedrooms and kitchens. Nobody could believe their eyes when they saw the Iron Man marching behind the farmers. At last they came to the town, and there was a great scrap metal yard. Interesting how the Iron Man didn't see this before. Everything was there. Old cars by the hundred. Old trucks. Old railway engines. Old stoves. Old fridges. Old springs. Bedsteads. Bicycles. Grinders. Gates. Pans. All the scrap iron of the region was piled up there, rusting away. It's nice to forget to students to draw this. All those um, nouns. Really good. And then old now. Uh, old stoves. Like, what does an old stove look like? There, cried Hogarth, eat all you can. The Iron Man gazed and his eyes turned red. He kneeled down in the, in the yard. He stretched out on one elbow. He picked up a greasy black stove and chewed it like a toffee. Nice simile. There were delicious crumbs of chrome on it. Again, these, I mean, Ted Hughes uses the same, like crack, 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 crack. But with aluminium, brass, chrome, he's using different metals. It's interesting that. He followed that, I guess it's it's an extension of the Iron Man. The Iron Man is made of metal and he, you, you're extending different types of metal. He followed that with a wider double deck of bedstead and the brass knobs made his eyes crackle with joy. Never before had the Iron Man eaten such delicacies. As he lay there, a big truck turned into the yard and unloaded a pile of rusty chain. The Iron Man lifted a handful of it and dangled it into his mouth. Better than any spaghetti. So they, So there they left him. It was an Iron Man's heaven. The farmers went back to their farms. Hogarth visited the Iron Man every few days. Now the Iron Man's eyes were constantly a happy blue. Nice, a happy blue. He was no longer rusty. His body gleamed blue like a new gun barrel. And he ate, 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 ate endlessly. So we have that chapter there. It's very easy to say that this is the end of the story. This could really be the end. It has all the features of a story. We have the beginning, we have a build-up, we have a climax or a problem, then we have a resolution, then we have a conclusion. So it's such a peaceful um, chapter in the way that we resolve all the tension. Everything is everything is fixed. There's no more we can to say about this. But we know there's two further chapters, chapters, and it's a nice little teaching of this is the eye, this is the calm before the storm. And in stories, it is used quite a lot where we talk about a story where there is something building up and then it's resolved. And then it seems like everything is, is happy again. Everything is, is sorted. 
And then, bam, that's when the big problem comes. I think in year five, year six, you have that idea of the, the problem mountain. You have the first one, just like this, where we have the, the problem, the, the build up conclusion. Yeah? And then we have the second one, the bigger wave. And this is exactly what this book is doing. We're getting ready for the second build up problem, climax, etc. resolution, conclusion. So we'll see what happens there. It's a lovely, lovely um, chapter. It has everything in it that you need. It's got the, the dialogue. It's got the detailed um, paragraphs. It's got um, some poetic features, not too much, but some poetic features and, and just a variety of other, other features, storytelling features. So yeah, a good chapter.